Just to introduce myself, I'm Professor Susan Watkins. I'm a professor in the School of Cultural Studies, and I'm also director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett. This is the third year of our Leeds Cultural Conversations talks. And really, the aim is to bring the research work of the staff in the centre to the public and find out what you think and how you can contribute. Uh, we have a number of partners. Um, Leeds City Council is um, uh, one of the key ones. LBU is a principal partner in the 2023 bid for Leeds to be European Capital of Culture. Our other partner is Palgrave, uh, who are a publisher, who have a campaign for the humanities. Um, they argue for the importance and value of humanities scholarship and publishing. Um, so worth checking out their um, website too. Um, this talk is part of Black History Month. Um, and we always try and do something for Black History Month because we think it's really important to do that. Um, Rob's work is very central to our post-colonial cultures strand in the centre. Um, but we've had other events in the past, like our Carnival Cultures Conference in May, which some of you may have attended or heard about. So thanks for coming. I'd just like to introduce Rob, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities at Leeds Beckett University where he teaches Victorian literature, history, and culture. His research focuses on imperialism, the slave trade and its abolition, travel writing, and the sea in the Victorian period. He's a main partner in the European research network, the Congo Free State, across languages, media, and culture, which is funded by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. He's published two books, Travel Writing and Atrocities, which came out in 2011, and The Suppression of the Atlantic Slave Trade, British Policies, Practices and Representations of Naval Coercion in 2015. So Rob is currently researching the production of Congolese testimony in and against the Congo Free State. And this work will be published in his next book, African Testimony in the Movement for Congo Reform, which is coming out next year. And it's that project that he's going to talk to us about today. His title is Black History and the Anti-Slavery Movement. So welcome all of you, and thanks, Rob. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to the organisers, and um, most importantly, thank you all for coming on to hear this today. Um, I'm going to make it to Congo uh, a bit later on in the paper. I'm going to do some preliminary work first. In fact, what I want to begin with is a bit of a bombshell in, in a way, because I want to sort of begin by wondering out loud about whether this talk should really be given. Um, there are problems with focusing on the history of slavery in Black History Month. Um, and if um, you don't sort of want to believe me that that's a problem, then I've got a couple of other authorities here who, who at least outline some of the issues that come along speaking about slavery in this particular month. So the QCA, um, Qualifications and Curriculum Authority, um, about 10 years ago, made a statement in one of its annual reports that the teaching of black history is too often confined to topics about slavery and post-war immigration, what's Black History Month. And then I was also looking online as, as sort of um, preparation for this talk and noticed that Anti-Slavery International, and in, on the second um, quotation here, it's got some sort of a list of do's and do nots when it comes to talking about slavery. And one of the do nots is do not teach slavery during Black History Month as it serves to reinforce a negative view of the slave trade being the only period of black history. The slave trade history is also not just black history, this person says, but world history, given its reach and its contemporary legacies. Should we talk about the history of slavery in Black History Month? Even if we're speaking specifically about the enslavement of African people and their descendants in the Atlantic world, of course, slavery has a much longer history going back to ancient times, but even if we're focusing on that Atlantic world history, then of course, this is not simply black history, but it's a global history which shapes entire continents and centuries, four continents and more than four centuries. Uh, Atlantic slavery is history, not black history. I think, of course, part of the problem which I'm getting toward here is that with the very concept of black history month itself, which works obviously despite its very good intentions to segregate and to confine 
black history. Um, what are those 11 other months if they're not black history months too? There's also a bit of a risk um, in pandering to the very dangerous idea that black history is, or at least begins with, the Atlantic slave trade, when of course we might otherwise explore innumerable other expressions of black history and heritage. And those problems, I'm going to pile up the problems before I start to clear them away a little bit later on in the paper, but those problems are compounded by the ways in which we sometimes go about telling the history of slavery, which too often is in ways that assigns action and agency almost exclusively to white slave dealers and then later white uh, anti-slavery activists. So that peoples of color figure in the narrative of slavery, for the most part, as silenced victims. Another thing which we tend to do, which makes this a difficult topic to uh, approach in this month, is to bring together the topic of slavery with the topic of abolition. Those two histories kind of get pushed together. So the 450 years of enslavement in the Atlantic world ends with the cheering uh, sort of finale, which is when um, things kind of get finally wrapped up by the work of uh, Wilberforce Clarkson and the rest to sort of atone, it seems, for a national sin. Or we might, if we turn our attention to the American context, we might say that the story of the Amistad revolt, the slave ship rebellion, the famous slave ship rebellion, ends not as it begins, which is with Africans taking charge of their destiny, and that's according to Marcus Redford's excellent book on the subject, but instead, too often, too traditionally, it ends with courtroom heroics of John Quincy Adams. That's Steven Spielberg's Hollywood take on the Armstrong Rebellion. And one other thing, and I'm going to stop listing problems, possibly. Um, one other thing that is, makes slavery an iffy topic to talk about in this month is that we tend to forget in traditional and popular retellings of this history that very often when slavery ends, when it's abolished, it leads to new forms of unfreedom, new states of coerced labour, such as apprenticeships. So in um, 1833, for instance, when uh, slavery is abolished in the British West Indies. It's replaced not by all-out freedom for the formerly enslaved peoples, but by a period of apprenticeship, which very quickly appeared to the authorities to be a new form of slavery, really, um, slavery under a new name, it's something which repeats in different uh, histories throughout the world. And the other thing that, of course, we sometimes forget about 1833 is those compensatory payouts that were made to the slave owners who received something like 20 million pounds, 20 million pounds in 1833 money, to relinquish their human holdings. So, okay, what I want to do in this paper is to revisit some of these problems in the representation of the history of slavery and of the anti-slavery movement, um, precisely to consider some of the ways in which Black History Month and the history of slavery might, after all, have some positive implications for one another. And by the way, regarding Black History Month, um, I raised some of the possible objections to it earlier, but I think that, frankly, it does still matter very much um, because black history is all too easily still marginalised. There's, for instance, a notable lack of black academic historians uh, employed in universities in this country, for instance. Um, when you've got Boris Johnson, um, who in 2008 referred to African people as Pekinese, while the mayor of London, uh, you know, on his path to power, um, and still an office. And I think Black History Month really matters still to remind us of this state. Um, but it can matter too to the history of slavery. If the value of Black History Month lies in its dedication to exploring the contributions made by too often marginalised historical figures and communities, in the making of regional and national histories and heritage, then I think it might well be time at which we take a closer look at the history of slavery and the anti-slavery movement, and to recover from its margins histories of black people's involvement 
in the ending of forced labour. So that's going to be the main thing which I speak about today, the ways in which uh, enslaved people and formerly enslaved people have brought about the ending of slavery through their own initiatives and actions. This could be made, I think, a more central part of the history of slavery by the work of Black History Month. But I actually also want to just be really quick here to add that this is old news to certain individuals and organisations around this country, such as the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, and to some of the historians who were in our own city, such as Joe Williams, who have been making a similar case to this for years. So this is going to be a paper of two halves. And in the first half, I'm going to explore how some of the uh, traditional narratives of the history of slavery employ a kind of white saviour motif um, focused on the heroic exploits of a small number of usually male anti-slavery legislators and activists. And I want us to think about how this story continues to be retold in this century and also how it comes from very early in the 19th century. In the second half of the paper, I'm going to turn to my own area of expertise, which, as Susan said, is the Congo at the end of the 19th century. And I'm going to look at how that story, too, has been told very often in some quite Eurocentric ways before outlining a new history of King Leopold's Congo based on the work of the Africans who helped to oppose colonial rule. Okay. My, first, um, my starting point is this map. Now, this is impossible to see, I suspect, from your vantage point. But it doesn't matter, actually, too much. I've got, I've got some detail there as well to look at. This is a map um, taken from Thomas Clarkson's history, well, I, I presume the first history of the anti-slavery movement, of the anti-slave trade movement, published in 1808. Um, and it's a map right at the start of that book. Um, Clarkson, as you perhaps know, was one of the leading figures in the anti-slave trade campaign, rode around England on horseback talking to sailors and to other interested parties to try to work out what was happening on slave ships and to bring home, literally bring home, the, the real evidence of the slave trade. He wrote a hurried out a history of um, the anti-slave trade movement in 1808, which is the same year that Britain legally stopped um, dealing in slaves in the Atlantic Ocean. And at the start of his book is this map now, this is a, a map of a river network, but it's no real place. There's no such place as this picture here. It. it does have a kind of utopian element to it, this map. And as with many utopias, actually, um, the more you think about it, the, the less great it seems. What Clarkson's trying to depict here are all of the various people who he saw as being crucial to the making of the anti-slave trade moment. So it's all the different names and figures who chipped in in order to bring about the ending of the slave trade. And he sort of imagines all of that work coming together as those mm -hmm. tributaries leading into these streams, which eventually becomes a torrent of anti-slave trade feeling. Um, and there's some detail up here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave the um, microphone behind. So you can see how this works, for instance. Clarkson himself, rather modestly, gives himself a stream. Um, some of the famous Quaker families, the Pens, uh, shown in this part of the map. Over on the far side of this bigger stream is Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, slave owner. OK. Um, but you can see how it works. What's really interesting to me about this map are the people who are not um, listed on it. Um, noticeably, there are no women. Uh, names on the map. They're there by virtue of some of the family names, I suppose, but strictly speaking, there are no women named, despite the work of Hannah Moore and other figures in um, the early anti slave trade campaigns. <coughs> Nor are there any people of colour. Um, this, despite, um, for instance, the best selling autobiography, um, The Interesting Narrative of Ola Udequiano which was published in 1789 and became one of the, um, yeah, a real important text in bringing home the message of slavery. It's a memoir which um, recounts Equiano's own experiences on the Middle Passage and the ways in which he freed himself from slavery. He's not there either. Uh, no groups of colour are, as I said. Certainly, who, the figures who are not present in this kind of history 
are the enslaved peoples who rebelled against slavery and, and, and helped bring about its downfall through more military actions. I guess I'm thinking in particular about Toussaint Louverture, who led the Haitian Rebellion uh, in the early 1790s through to 1804. I'm thinking about the uh, rebellion of the Maroons in Jamaica in the 1790s, Bruce's slave rebellion in Barbados in 1816, um, the Baptist Wars, as they were called, in Jamaica in 1831, which was violently suppressed. None of these things, of course, this goes beyond the time that Clarkson is mapping here, but none of this kind of um, activity figures in traditional histories of the anti-slavery movement. That last one, which I mentioned, is probably worth just spending a bit of time with, the Baptist War Rebellion in 1831. It's also known as Sam Sharp's Rebellion. There's a picture of um, Sharp, and there's one of Equiano too. Sharp had organized a peaceful strike on Christmas Day of 1831. But when this was violently broken up, it escalated into the largest rebellion to date on, on the island, on, on Jamaica, in which thousands were killed, including 14 white soldiers. Sharp is famous for having reported to have said, and I'm quoting his reported words here, I would rather die on yonder gallows than live for a minute more in slavery prior to his being executed for his role in the uprising. These are just some of the major outbreaks against slavery, which I've just been listening to you. They're important in the ending of slavery, ultimately, because, well, they destabilized the whole institution of slavery. They made it less profitable, if nothing else. But also, clearly, in rebelling against the circumstances in which they lived, enslaved people sent a clear message to their owners and to faraway people in the metropolitan centers of Europe that they too valued liberty to the point of giving up their lives for it. And in, in sending that message, they undermined pro-slavery arguments at the time, which was that people of African descent were naturally servile, fit for enslavement. Rebellion showed otherwise. So all of that, really, this is a history of absence which I've been telling so far, all of that is missing from the map of Clarkson and the kind of historiography that it represents. But there's a bit more to this, too. There's a bit more, and a bit more iffiness when it comes to how, in the 19th century in particular, white writers and white patrons went about remembering slavery and abolition. This is, a, well, in my mind, quite a notorious image from the end of the 19th century. Um, and what we've got, I think, happening in this image is history congealing into a myth. The history that this picture represents is the Royal Navy's attempts to end the slave trade by capturing slave ships and rescuing their human cargoes, which really took place, took place from 1808 through to about 1865. That's the history. The myth that this picture represents is that the endeavor was undertaken by brave, brawny, and heroic British tars and officers to the benefit of these downtrodden, cowed Africans. There's a good description of this painting by the art critic Marcus Wood, which I'm just going to read for you. He says, white angelic British tars, I mean sailors, bathed in a celestial light, reach down to the slaves who strive classical poses of despair as they wallow mimicking lost souls in the infernal regions. Emotion is at a fever pitch, and very British mercy is at hand. Now, of course, it might well be that sailors did indeed act heroically in rescuing slaves. And they, by the way, they rescued about 160,000 in, in the 50 years the Royal Navy was active. And more importantly, they served as a very big deterrent to the slave trade in Africa. So there is a certain amount of heroism there to be remembered. And of course, slaves were often in a very miserable condition when they were rescued. But of course, this image is doing more than simply reporting those realities. The religious imagery, the contrasting dark and light, the recreation of Michelangelo's God's creation of Adam, so that God's role is taken up by a British sailor 
All of this loads the image with imagery which tells us a lot about Britain's perception of its new role in relation to slavery. Um, the enslaved figures in the picture, of course, are also recreating this famous anti-slavery logo first designed by Jacqueline Wedgwood and picked up and reused all over the place throughout the 19th century of the kneeling, chained slave um, encircled by the caption, am I not a man and a brother? Um, and there's, a, there was a, there's a female counterpart as well, which produced in the 1830s, I'm not a woman and a sister, in which British mercy again takes this sort of angelic form, it's Britannia herself, I suppose, in that image. At this time in history, we witness an outpouring of self applause and self satisfied representations of the middle passage as a dark chapter in British history, but one from which Britain could ultimately take pride in having led the way to abolition. And in having abolished the slave trade, many Britons would come to argue that Britain had showed the way forward for other nations, and had therefore confirmed its own status as the world's most progressive and benevolent nation, and perhaps therefore the fittest nation to lead in world affairs. All of the complexities of the motivations for abolishing slavery are lost in imagery like this. Um, but since the 1940s, since Eric Williams' famous thesis on the topic, it's become clear to historians that actually abolition happens not just because of charitable reasons, but a complex set of reasons, including <coughs> economic motivations too. So abolition of the slave trade, in other words, begins to instill in many British people's minds the nation's credentials for imperial power. In the late 19th century, at the time when Britain was emerging as the most powerful nation in the world, bar none, and iron up parts of the African continent in particular for colonialism. One of the many problems with this kind of myth-making, of course, is that the African recipient of imperial goodwill becomes forever locked in this perpetual kind of dependence, always re-enslaved by gratitude, perhaps, or at least forever in that position of the passive, downtrodden <coughs> victim of oppression. Um, this is a process which happens through many texts over the course of the 19th century, and it's impossible to sort of pinpoint exactly when it starts to happen. But if I, had, if I was really forced to sort of say when, you could go as far back as 1807, and a poem written by uh, William Wordsworth, right on the eve of Britain's abolition of its slave trade. This is a sonnet written as a tribute to Thomas Clarkson, the man who'd been so crucial um, to the ending of the slave trade. Will, of course, gets all the attention and all of the plaudits at the time, but it's Clarkson who does a lot of the legwork. And uh, Wordsworth sort of acknowledges that in this poem, and I look at this with my students, and, so, um, and the question that I ask them is that this is a poem that was published to mark the ending of the slave trade, and the question that I ask them is, is this a poem about slavery at all? I'll just read it quickly to you and see what you think. <coughs> Clarkson, it was an obstinate hill to climb. How toilsome, nay, how dire it was, by thee is known, by none perhaps so feelingly. But thou, who staring in thy fervent prime, did first lead forth this pilgrimage sublime, hast heard the constant voice its charge repeat, which out of thy young heart's oracular seat first roused thee. O true yoke fellow of time, with unabating effort, see, the palm is won, the prize is won, and by all nations shall be worn. The bloody writing is forever torn, and thou henceforth shalt have a good man's calm, a great man's happiness. Thy seal shall find repose at length, firm friend of humankind. So is this a poem about slavery? Well, the only, the closest we get to a mention of slavery itself in this poem is, I think that line, the bloody writing is forever torn. 
It's a kind of strange way of thinking about slavery, presumably from the perspective of those enslaved as a kind of form of writing, as a form of legislation. But what's happening here is that the, the, the reality of the suffering of the slave is falling out of view. And instead, Britain is telling itself a different story, one of abolition. Now, of course, things are not quite the same as they were back then, and particularly in light of um, the 2007 commemorations of the Abolition Act, it was the bicentennial year of the Abolition Act. Things have moved on a bit, and um, there, are, there are, of course, lots of very traditional representations of the slave trade at that time, which kind of worked in much the same way to deploy this white savior notion. Um, William Hague's biography of Wilberforce, for instance. Um, but what we did see at that time was a broadening out of the narrative so that other voices were being inclu included. Um, a more reflective approach to thinking about the history was ushered in around 2007, um, as represented, for instance, in these stamps, the commemorative stamps that came out, and did give some due to those um, people of African descent, and also a woman, Anna Moore, um, taking place in the collection alongside the big names of Wilberforce, Clarkson and Granville Sharp. But I'd say that these kind of acknowledgements of black history remain fairly limited and patchy. They're often confined to the extraordinary individuals, such as Equiano, themselves, of course, patronised by leading white anti-slavery figures. And they tend to be confined to big landmark moments of change. Equiano, by the way, I just want to say a, bit, a, a word or two more about him, because he really is the most famous figure from this history. He's the one that um, people might know. He, he was named, actually, as part of the primary curriculum uh, in Michael Gove's first draft of it, as a figure that needs to be studied at primary education level. He's not on that draft anymore, actually. but. Um, but there you go. Um, there's a problem with Equiano, which is that um, recent research has revealed he may not be African after all. His book is called The Interesting Narrative of Robert Equiano, um, The African. Um, some research has been done by an American academic called Ben Coretta, which suggests that he may have sort of forged this identity and that he may have actually been born in um, Carolina, I think. Um, and this is a bit of a devastating blow to, of course, many historians of, of Africa and of slavery. Um, what to do with this? I think that, you know, it matters a lot this because Epiano is such a leading figure here that he's really all we've got from that period, or one of the very much leading lights that we have. What to do with this problem about him? Well, um, I think we either accept that um, he was an extraordinary figure who came from Africa, genuinely, Always except that he was an extraordinary figure who came from America and was clever enough to see that the best way to write his memoir and to attract the most sympathy for it was to tell it from the perspective of an African. And so to join the hundreds of people throughout history who sort of you know, invented themselves in their autobiographies. Um, but the problem with Equiano really is only that um, he's left alone, that he's such an isolated figure. If we had more historical figures from that period to draw on, then the problem around his identity would seem less important, I think. We need to broaden our knowledge base to understand other black opponents of slavery from this time throughout the 19th century. It's something I'm going to try to begin to address for the rest of my time in this paper. I was going to talk about these films which came out quite recently um, as sort of um, worrying examples of the ways in which um, white people continue to tell themselves quite cheering and delusionary narratives of the history of slavery. Kahindi Andrews has written a good article about that if you want to read one more. I'm going to spare you um, to get onto my own search um, because time is otherwise too short. So it's with all of those thoughts in mind about this need to recover other stories of African people's interventions in the history of slavery that I turn to my own research 
which is about the Congo Free State, um, a, a colony uh, founded by Europeans in Africa, right in the middle of Africa at the end of the 19th century. Um, so I'm not, strictly speaking, talking about slavery anymore, nor am I, strictly speaking, talking about abolition, because the opposition to sort of mend clothing, not to get rid of it at this time. But I wonder how much you know about the Congo Free State. It was founded um, amid the scramble for Africa, the famous scramble for Africa in the end of the 19th century when the European powers and America too got together in Berlin in 1884 and decided which bits of the African continent would go to which European rulers. And it was decided that the Congo River Basin, or the area south of the river, which is the same size as Western Europe, would be given to King Leopold II of Belgium. Um, and not given to Belgium, but to King Leopold, specifically as a private enterprise for him to run. And Leopold agreed that in exchange for this big prize, he would open the place up to free trade, he would eliminate slave dealing, and he would um, instill Christianity among the African populations there. Um, but it's expensive business running a colony of that size, and when Leopold was failing to make any profits from it, he banned all the other Europeans from free trade, or many of them anyway, and he also imposed on the populations of the Congo River Basin a slave-like regime of forced labour in order to sort of in return for as payment for their civilization, if you like. Um, the people of the Congo were particularly unlucky that at this time in history, um, Goodyear came along and patented the um, vulcanized rubber tire. So suddenly there was this big world demand for rubber, and um, this meant that it became extremely profitable, and um, the people of the Congo were basically brutalized and driven to collect rubber at any price by Europeans there. Um, estimates vary as to how many people died under Leopold's watch in the Congo, which was from 1885 to 1908, so just over 20 years. They vary the estimates from 3 million people to 10 million people, and maybe even more. It was noticed in Europe, it was noticed particularly after Leopold started to exclude other people from the profits, people started to get upset, and a humanitarian uh, movement was arranged in, first in Liverpool by a journalist called Edie Morell. And he got together all of the sort of humanitarian parties of the day and launched this campaign to try to pressurise Leopold and to try to pressurise the governments of Britain and France or the other major powers to do something about this. And finally, that pressure told him, <coughs> and Leopold was forced to give up his Congo colony, uh, it became Belgium um, in 1908. So my interest is in this colony and what happened there, and in the humanitarian campaign against it. Um, but I'm also interested in the way that that story has been told in the past. There's really one very famous book about all of this, called King Leopold's Ghost. And it's, it's kind of the go-to book on this subject still. It's um, probably we, we subscribe it to our history students, I imagine. Um, it typifies many of those Eurocentric tendencies of which I've spoken in this paper. The author, Adam Hoshio, tells himself toward the end of that book that it's just impossible to tell this story based around African characters, African agency. We must focus, he says, on um, the supporters or opponents of Leopold who are European or American. If we are to enter deeply into the personal lives of indig individual Congolese in this period, it may have to be done in fiction, as novelists like Chinua Achebe have done for the colonial era elsewhere, or as Toni Morrison has done for the lives um, of enslaved Africans, uh, African Americans. Um, but he's aware, Hoshio, that there are materials um, in the archives, written or altered in other ways by Congolese people. Uh, he kind of overlooks them in, in reaching this conclusion. He says that instead of reaching those voices, all we can hear is silence. Um, the research I've been doing so far has turned over, has turned up rather, more than 300 
um, witness statements, interviews, letters, um, various other forms of testimony given by Congolese peoples. So what I'm in the process of doing is kind of writing a new history of um, the reform of Leopold Congo based around the actions of Congolese peoples who stood up and opposed the violence there. Um, and this research really means going to the archives and digging around and finding these people. Um, but it, and one of the other things that I found really important in doing it is also finding photographs where possible um, sort of brings home the reality of these people. This, this woman which was on the previous slide that I showed you. Um, and we can fill in a bit of the background on her. Her name was uh, Boali. And she was an important figure in bringing home some of the violence that's happening right in the middle of the Congo and around 1904. In 1904, Leopold sent some investigators under pressure from the other European powers to go and look into what was happening. And they collected a load of testimonies, including one from Boali. Um, I found a picture in a magazine of her being carried to give her testimony to the Europeans. That's her and her husband's back being taken to speak before this commission of inquiry had happened. When she resisted rape by armed soldiers, Boali had been shot in the abdomen, and you can actually just see the, the swelling in her midriff there. As she lay on the ground, her foot was cut off, and her ankle, sorry, her foot was cut off and her anklet was stolen. Um, she was one of 13 women and girls who gave statements before Leopold's investigative commission. Um, and her words and her bodily wounds were said to have had a great impact on her listeners. Her words are recorded in the archive. What she said before the commission of inquiry, I found in an archive in Brussels, and the translation of it is here. Um, her picture also would come to move European audiences in Britain. Um, it would show this photograph in various publications. But one of the things that's interesting about Boali is that she really typifies the way in which African people often end up serving as displays or exhibits of violence rather than as testifiers themselves. It's her image which gets circulated, not her words, despite the definite impact that they said to have had on Leopold's investigators. OK, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. How long do I have? Sorry? Oh, really? Okay. Well, I might stop talking before that and give time for everybody to speak. Um, yeah, what happens is that we, we tend to get the, the picture over and over again of these injured peoples, and we don't hear their stories, and even eventually in the propaganda against Leopold, the names get detached from the image too, so we get these sort of atrocity montages, which are slightly dubious in a way, you know, whose stories are we looking at here? And um, so one of the work jobs that I'm trying to do is to try to work backwards from these images and to work out who exactly these individuals were, because they all had a story. And I'm thinking also about the circumstances in which they came to give their story. Um, the way in which they came to get their story often was through the work of other Congolese people who, who brought their plight to the Europeans' attention. The woman in the middle of this photograph is Lena Frederica Clark. She was born um, over on the west coast of Africa, but in the Congo, and was redeemed from a life of slavery on the coast um, by missionaries then taken to Scotland, she spent some time in Edinburgh, and then she went on to um, Spelman Seminary, which is an um, education institution for African-American women in Atlanta, Georgia, um, before finally returning back to Central Africa, where she began life as a missionary. Now, she's an interesting figure, Lena Park, because she was, she's a brilliant linguist and is kind of regarded as such in, in, in the time that she lived, in the early 1900s. And later in her career, when she moved to southern Nigeria, again to work as a missionary, she produced some of the first language studies of, of the Jukunoi people there. 
1903, she worked as a translator for British investigators in the Congo, in particular Roger Casement, um, helping him to find out what had happened to the people around Lake Mantumba and bringing their stories to light. Um, and in 1904, she also deposed evidence before King Leopold's Commission of Inquiry, evidence of her first-hand encounters with the brutality of the colonialists in the 1890s. The transcriptions which are made of her interviews with the young girls at Lake Mantumba become key evidence in the movement for Congo reform and they feature widely in propaganda. And they've more recently been regarded as some of the most progressive and modern sounding testimonies recorded from the early 19th century. And of course, they're also extremely rare as women's testimonies for violence from this period. Okay, my plans, oh, and yeah, just to sort of show you how far you can go in recounting these people's lives with a bit of archive work. This is the inside of Nina Clark's house. I don't know what to do with this photograph. I just like the fact that we can sort of know her life that much. It's actually quite creepy being able to look into her, her living quarters. But this is, this is the house that she lived in in 1903. Um, there, there are these lines out there waiting to be kind of recovered, I suppose, is what I'm saying. I just went, um, what I'm going to do is introduce you to one more character from my, the, the work that I'm doing. And um, then I'll wrap up and leave some room for comment or questions. But it was these evangelists, African evangelists, African converts to Christianity that played an important role in bringing to light evidence of atrocities. Um, the reason for that is, is because these new Christians were widely used by the missions in Africa, and they particularly were well used in the regions where some of the worst violence was happening. Their role was to travel out to try to extend Christian influence by preaching and by basically acting as sort of examples of the benefits of Christianity. Of course, these people were bound up in the broader imposition of Western life into Central Africa. Travelling to preach demanded that these evangelists journey into foreign and sometimes hostile territories. And because they were posted to areas that the Europeans regarded as being remote, off the main courses of communication, they often found themselves in the front line of colonisation in the Congo where some of the worst violence was happening. So new Christians contributed to the reform cause by guiding uh, Westerners to these communities that were suffering by working as translators to bring the stories to light and also by providing their own witness statements. Now this figure, Mbilo, is a really interesting character to me. Um, he was one of the leading uh, missionaries of the station called Mikau. He had been taken in as a child refugee, baptised, married in a Christian ceremony and trained to preach. He was a driving force in the Congo Bololo mission for 13 years until his death in 1906. He had a far-reaching influence according to the missionary tributes that were written to him. He's an interesting figure because it seems to me that he was a bit of a rebel rouser among the people. Um, he certainly never bowed down to the colonial authorities in his vicinity and frequently sort of ran into trouble with them. <coughs> There were attempts by the Europeans to try to get him imprisoned, but each of these attempts failed. Um, and one of the missionaries who were sympathetic to him at this time, B.J. Lower, wrote in a diary extract that we have only two good reasons to believe that some of the agents of the local rubber company that was causing all the violence in, in that area would like to get Mbilo out of the way, <clears throat> as he, perhaps more than anyone we have, has travelled in districts where the people are cruelly treated and could tell much that would not be creditable to this rubber company. So it's figures like this, really, that I'm trying to bring to light in my research and to sort of point out that African people played a fundamental role in bringing to light the atrocities in King Leopold's colony. Of course, atrocities are very hard to, to witness if you're a third party. They tend to happen behind closed doors and have to be pieced together using circumstantial evidence. Um, it was the job of these Africans really to piece together the clues that Europeans then brought to light in, over in the West. 
But it's also quite noticeable, and I'm moving toward a conclusion now, it's noticeable that each of these figures that I've spoken about, and actually all of the African stories that I've recount, I'm recounting in my own book, they quickly fall into obscurity in their own time. While their input into the Congo reform movement was crucial, often the propaganda that they helped to create hides their contributions from public view. Time and again, evidence derived from Congolese efforts gets disregarded or detached from those efforts at the point of receiving attention. And while there are various reasons for this kind of process of re-silencing, and part of the reason why this is happening is just to protect individuals like the Bureau from repercussions, the underlying cause which connects all of these various examples is a racially determined prioritization of European experience and skills of narration based on Western notions of truth and ethics. What happens in that early history leads to the kind of stories that we have now in the Congo, which are focused entirely on the actions of Westerners. Um, what I'm saying is that rather than inherit this 19th century version of events, our task ought to be to rethink its Eurocentrism in favour of something more inclusive. Okay, right, just to conclude, yeah, I'm going to skip those. Um, to conclude, I'm going to ask why does this matter to us today? And um, I can answer that question in various ways. I might, for instance, look at student activism, which is happening in the UK and elsewhere around the world, and the movement, particularly among the BME student community, to call for a decolonised curriculum, which um, focuses less on white history and offers a more inclusive brand and is more sceptical in its attitude towards the canon and towards traditional historical narratives. I might point to slavery today. There was a report in the Guardian a couple of weeks ago that it's around 40 million people who are um, defined as enslaved around the world today, and maybe Black History Month could help us connect back up with those people to think about them. I might even point to your mobile phones, which contain um, in their batteries, coltan, not mine, it's ancient, but other people, <laughs> contains coltan, which is this mineral which comes from eastern Congo and is um, fueling the ongoing war in that territory. And maybe this history can help us to think about our sort of low level complicity in that process. But actually, I want to. <clears throat> answer my question why this matter today by thinking back again to where I began this paper and to return to the question of the role that the history of slavery might play in black history month. One answer I think lies in what these stories can tell us about human rights and the meanings of personal liberty in different cultures and time periods. The European view of Central Africa in the 19th century was that they did not, I'm doing the quotation marks here, not looking at me. They did not share our um, sense of the value of individual liberty and were more naturally subservient than other people. But what my research is finding is that across various locations, given the opportunity to speak out free from intimidation or coercion, people of the Congo did so. And their acts of witnessing proved, perhaps more certainly, than their individual prizing of liberty, the fundamental injustice of colonialism in the Congo Free State, an attempt to deny other people's freedom on the basis of a greater ability for viciousness and greed. Viewed from below, in fact, what seems surprising is not that Africans voiced concepts of liberty in their struggle against colonization, but that the colonizing nations ascribe liberty to their own societies and cultures while creating states of unfreedom throughout Africa. But, as Kwame Anthony Apia has recently argued in his Reef Lecture from 2016, that apparent irony is only an irony if we maintain an essential view of cultures based on presumed difference rather than actual take-up. What Apia says, and I think his words are quite inspiring, is this. Values aren't the birthright. You need to keep caring about them. The values European humans like to espouse belong just as easily to an Africa or an, or an Asian who takes them up with enthusiasm as they do to a European 
by that same logic, they do not belong to a European who has not taken the trouble to understand and absorb them. I think one of the values of anti-slavery history for Black History Month lies precisely in that insight. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. That was fascinating and really thought-provoking. Does anyone have any questions that, or would like to start us off on some kind of discussion for the last few minutes? Yes. What, what was the fight of the Africans free from set slavery? Was that totally distinct and not seen as in common either side by the English working class? I mean, they, they, I mean the English working class, and don't get me wrong, yeah, they were as unfree in some respects, I don't know if entirely, uh, and it was being recognised in that period. And presumably this is part of I mean, what you rightly said, wasn't this? Middle class white European bosses who you know, were free and they was then themselves, and similarly, the working class, like the top, you know, top and, 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 and so on, who, who were fighting for freedom. Did they not mm-hmm. say that they had something in common? They, they make the connection often in, 19, in the 19th century, get this discourse of white slavery where you know, the, the, the working classes say, Look at us, we've got it just as bad as those people over on the far side of the Atlantic. Because suddenly you're free, what about us? And the connection is even made between the ending of slavery in the West Indies and industrialization in England. Oh, suddenly now we're going to do the work, that kind of thing. Rarely, though, is there that sort of empathetic <coughs> understanding that's similar yeah, that, 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 at this point in time in the writing. Um, you get it occasionally, but more often there's a sort of competitive edge to the writing which contrasts the supposed freedom of the West Indians with a lot of the, with the slave of the, of the needle, uh, you know, the, the white working class woman, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and just to find out, what are you sort of saying then to say in Congo that Christianity, not Christian, but Christianity was a driving force in doing away with some of the cruelty in slavery? It's a good question. I mean, fundamentally, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, a sort of deep-seated level, um, the idea of imposing Christianity on people in the Congo is bound up with the violence that happens there, absolutely. On a more practical level, Christian missions, in particular the Protestant missions, were one of the better places to turn to at that time to try to voice um, the suffering, to, to find an outlet to express the suffering that was happening. But the bigger picture, I think, is that Christianity is bound up in this process of colonisation and slavery. Yes? Um, yes, uh, after that the words of this story, mm. um, what to me seems like an ode to the, to the great men of the history. As though, you know, we think about the abolition of slavery, it clearly would of course have never existed. But some argue history is made by great movements, men and women, and in this case, black people themselves. So I, so, I, so I just think your researchers do a really good job in giving a voice to people who have forgotten about who are perhaps, if you like, the great, great movements and individuals of history. Thank you. Yeah. To be fair to Wordsworth, it's not his best moment. <laughs> um, but he published it, so. Yes, anyone else? Yes. Uh, me ask, were they actually doing research? Were into these papers that you're actually looking at at the moment? What was that? Where are the papers? Oh, you're yeah. Well, I mean, it's mainly in missionary archives that I've been looking. Um, so. Yeah, in this country and in America, where, where the Protestant missions came from. Um, but there's a big selection of material as well in Brussels too, which is quite was quite famously under embargo for much of the 20th century. There was a note on the on the archive saying it's not open to researchers. And it was a Belgian diplomat called Jules Marchal who campaigned for years and years to get access to that material and to reveal you know, the horrors that it contained. Um, and he published his book in 
the early 1980s, I think. Since then, not really many people have looked at it. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the big famous book, King Leopold's Ghost by Hoshiel, doesn't really make use of that material either. Why? I think that it fits in with the c contemporary view of the Congos and the Congolese still as being history's victims and, um, and still being in need in various ways of sort of Western intervention. It's, they played a part in that book of being victims um, awaiting heroic intervention. <coughs> still going on, there was, in um, 2017, in fact, the New York Times article just published, I think, even in August. Um, about the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the same place that I'm talking about in my paper, which is called Up the Congo with Conrad or something. It's written by a professor at Harvard, and it's just the same, the same perspective still. Um, yeah, things don't change. We're still trying to take this Eurocentric perspective on the Congo. Yes, Emily. Um, thanks for an excellent paper, Rob. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's a wonderful thing to be you know, looking at the agency of black people in terms of uh, tending into colonisation and slavery. but is there, uh, were there other any issues with the status of the narratives themselves in the Congolese? Were they paid for them? Were they pressured to conform uh, to Christianity? Um, so I was wondering if you could just, and then also I was also thinking, um, to what extent the um, Congo reform movement also might have fed into that narrative of, that we see in Heart of Darkness, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, that you know, this is the wrong form of colonialism. They're, but we, you know, the British are doing the right type of colonialism. Yeah, yeah okay. That was three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that reform campaign, like I said, it's reform, it's not abolition. Mm -hmm. Their argument is we need to see a more humane version of imperialism here. They're quite open to that being Belgian. It's just that they're trying to put an end to the atrocities that are happening in this particularly brutal version, but it's imperialism nonetheless that they want to see in place. Um, so yeah, I think it is all part and part the end of the same discourse. Um, yeah, I t the, showing those faces and telling that, recreating their, you know, in quotations, some of their words, only tells half this story, really. And when I first started doing this research, I thought that, I thought that I was onto kind of like a popular history here, and that um, you know, I'd be able to tell this quite cheering story of these Africans who fought for their own course. It's more complicated than that. And um, actually, what I'm writing is a much more miserable book about the ways in which, yeah, the, the, the dividing line between freedom and coercion shows up again when it comes to the making of these testimonies. Um, they weren't, in, in any circumstances that I'm aware of, paid to give, to give them. But it's unclear often the, the precise circumstances in which they come together, and it does seem that you know they're sort of doing a favour for a local European, which is never going to be repaid. Yeah. That leads to all kinds of questions about whose voice it is you really hear when you're looking at those testimonies, which is a whole other paper. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um. I think we probably ought to leave it there, I'm afraid, but Rob will wait here and have a chat with anyone one-to-one -one while we uh, finish up. I know people have got places to be. Can we just give Rob a big um, round of applause?